subject of fasting is something that that I never really had any teaching on, never had, well, never really knew that it existed from my uh, former denomination that we were in and that we were a part of. I didn't know anything about fasting. Somewhere along the way, I'd probably heard the word fasting, and I assume, I don't know, but I assume I knew uh, that fasting meant that you went without food, but I didn't know why or anything that uh, the Bible had to say that involved this subject of fasting. And it wasn't until I became charismatic back in the mid-1970s that I, my eyes were first opened to this whole, well, it was, you know, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, just by definition, uh, your eyes are, let's say, it is supposed to be by definition, that your eyes are just open to an entirely new and different spiritual realm. Thank you. And fasting is just one of those things that uh, a charismatic Christian's eyes uh, should be open to if they've not already seen it from the Word of God uh, prior to this. And back whenever I received the Holy Spirit, like I said, back just several years ago now, uh, back in the mid-70s, this is when the charismatic movement was really just sweeping the country. And it was breaking down all the, or going over all the denominational barriers, and you have tens of thousands of denominational Christians receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so along with this movement, I noticed, and I can remember looking back, and I noticed then, but there were two particular things that I remember were emphasized just everywhere I went. We had a teaching on one of these two things. One was the gifts of the Spirit, and the other thing was fasting. I always heard either a message on the gifts of the Spirit and just heard messages on the gifts all the time. That was much more prevalent than fasting. But then running uh, second behind uh, the first horse gift, that second horse was fasting. And here again, it was because people having received the baptism of the Holy Spirit had their eyes open to a new spiritual realm. And one of the things that, as I said, by definition should come with the baptism is the subject of fasting, along with gifts of the Spirit and faith and healing and a lot of other things. But fasting is one of those things that should just come along. And so along this same time, you've got uh, just a tremendous amount, not only of uh, tapes on the subject, but especially of printed literature on the subject of fasting and on the subject of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, from what I can remember myself, and I have a lot of, of books on the subject, and this is why I believe this is true, what I can remember, the printed literature, there was more printed literature, I'm talking about in the form of books now, in the area of fasting than there were in the gifts of the Spirit because the Assemblies of God already had many books out on the gifts of the Spirit by people like Stanley Horton, and I had some of his books, and Howard Carter. Howard Carter has several books on the gifts of the Spirit, and these were old, old line Assembly of God ministers back to the turn of this century. So, uh, as I was saying, there are a lot of books come out on the subject of fasting, and so everyone being naive at that time, and everyone, whenever they re do receive the Holy Spirit, being naive at that time, then uh, you just have all types of material that's presented, and simply because it is more or less a new revelation, not that it's new beyond the Word of God, but just that people have never seen it before. It's new in that sense. Because it's new, then you have all types of, uh, well, different books and just some of the chapter titles. I was looking back over some books a while back anyway, not recently, but uh, just to really get to you. And they would go over all types of things. Some of the books would rate fasting, rate your type of fast from a Moses fast. Of course, that would be the best fast. That was the biggest and the best fast, down to a Jesus fast. And then you've got a pleasant bread fast, mentioned over in Daniel 10. Then you've got a three-day fast. A lot of people go on three-day fast. Then you're down to your standard fast, which is a day long. And uh, then most people, of course, are excluded from all those, and they fall under one of these last two categories. That is your fruit juice fast, fruit juice fast, or... And this is where most people fell, I guess the last one, and that was chewing gum, candy bars, and soft drinks. 
and you pass from one of those uh, that one of those things in that last category, and then you would be on the bottom of the totem totem pole as far as the subject of fasting was concerned. And all I could see was that people were just taking the word, the English word fast, for exactly what it said, and that was, let's get over with this in a hurry, let's do it fast. And so they'd limit it to, and I guess that's what they thought the word meant, do it fast. So they'd limit it to one day, or generally one meal, and in between cut out the chewing gum, the candy bars, and bottles of pop. And that was really going to tear down Satan's strongholds and bring revival in the United States, because you quit chewing Wrigley Spearmint gum or something. And then you've got other chapters in these books, other teachings concerning the proper times you should fast and you shouldn't fast. And I'm saying all this to make a point in a moment. And so the times you're not to fast, of course, are the holiday seasons because it's too tempting then. So what are you celebrating the holiday seasons in the first place for? Well, not that much light was given to us back then at that point. So anyway, you don't celebrate during the holiday, you don't uh, fast during the, the holiday season. You don't fast whenever your wife's going to have a dinner party or when it's your husband's payday because he may take you out to dinner that night or if it's little Johnny's birthday. And they'd have all these things explained so you'd know just when you could fast or when you should fast and when you shouldn't fast. And then along with that, and this was one of the best teachings they had, is how to break your fast. Keep plenty of doctors and nurses on hand because you may die. Eat light food, tomato juice, and orange juice. That's how you broke your fast. It was tomato juice and orange juice. Keep the doctors and nurses. Keep the telephone there by the bedside because something drastic may happen. And I mean that's literally true. They would go into, I've got books with just chapters on how to break your fast. Uh, and be careful, you know, don't... Uh, do like probably most of you do what I do is go get something like a pizza whenever you're too fasting. Certainly don't go eat a pizza or uh, brownies with a lot of nuts and raisins in them or something like that. You certainly don't want to eat anything with nuts in it once you've broken the fast. And then generally the way these books would conclude would be with several chapters on testimonies of how many devils they got out of this fella uh, because they fasted for him. And there's nothing wrong with the testimonies. I enjoyed a lot of those. But the problem was I never really had any teaching to go along with those testimonies besides what I just gave you. And my advice in the area of fasting is stay away from books that teach on fasting because I've never found one yet that's been right on. There are some of them that have some things right, and uh, my eyes, the first time when my eyes were open to the subject of fasting, I had read some book... Uh, entitled Prayer and Fasting, How to Open Doors or Unlock Doors or something by Prayer and Fasting. And it had all these things I just mentioned in it, but it also just had the plain subject of fasting, and that was brand new to me. So anything that it had to say about fasting at all was revelation to me, and I began to put it in practice in a hurry. But on the other hand, with all the denominations and even charismatic groups then and now, there, are, there were several different positions that the people would take on fasting, and I want to give you some of these. The first one just included some denominations, and that position was that some denominations believed in and practiced fasting occasionally, but it was for a, a religious duty that they did it. They did it then, and some still do it today. They fast merely for a religious duty. And this is what Jesus is talking against in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, our verses that we're looking at. That fasting, you should never allow fasting to become a religious duty to you. But if that's the official stance of your denomination, and to be uh, a loyal, faithful convert of that denomination then you'll have to participate in what they tell you to do. Then they tell you when to fast and what not to eat when you're supposed to fast. And as a result, you end up with a religious duty. Secondly, and this is the most widespread belief among denominations, is that fasting was a Jewish legalism. That the Jews were required to fast. And you can just about ask anybody, and they'll say this, that that was a Jewish legalism 
and it's no longer for Christians under grace. Grace means a license to eat till you're full, and certainly not to do without. And I suppose in everything that I believe, and this includes tongues and divine healing and non-resistance, I've had more negative remarks, more persecution from relatives in this area of fasting than in any other area. I think maybe divine healing would come in probably second. Tongues way down the line, you know. Or demons way down the line. But it's this fasting, and then right behind it would be divine healing, those two things. Had more problems with people over what I felt to be the scriptural position on fasting. Would get downright mad and mean and agitated to find out that you were depriving that body that God gave you that he says in his word needs nourishment of its proper dietary intake. And that was their rationale. Now, God expects you to eat because your body won't function if you don't eat. Well, what can you say about that? That's exactly right. You'd have to give them a whole teaching on fasting, and even to start to do that would make them very, very upset. I can remember one time in particular, and as time went along, and uh, my belief stayed steadfast, and my life in my home wasn't like most Christians, a roller coaster up, down, in, out, on, off, hot, and cold. When they saw that it was steadfast and consistent, and they began to back down in this area of fasting, and I got to fast whenever I wanted to and do it however I wanted to. But at the beginning, I more or less had to do it uh, and you see, when you live with someone, uh, they know when you're fasting. If you live with them, they know when you're fasting. But I had to work it out in such a way where they didn't know. Now, that's the point of what Jesus is saying, if they not know. But it's just, it's next to impossible if you live with someone for them not to know that you're fasting. If it's longer than for a meal or for, you know, two or three hours, then uh, they're not going to catch that you were fasting there if it was for two or three hours. Some people can't go two or three hours without eating which is just, again, one of the problems of this country and the way our society has been set up with three meals a day and a lot of snacks in between. And there's no break fast, break your fast in the morning because, uh, and this is a stereotype, uh, you see on the commercials there the light pops on and there, you know who is, sneaking into the icebox in the middle of the night. So there's no such thing as breakfast for an American. They've already broken their fast. That's what the word breakfast means. You broke your fast, that you're supposed to be fasting while you sleep. And people set that alarm, compulsive eaters, and get up and go get them something to eat out of the icebox during the night. Well, anyway, this one particular occasion, as I said, later on in my experience, I was able to, uh, to work it out where I could fast pretty much whenever I wanted to and go as long as I wanted to, and I didn't have any flack over that. But before I got to this point, I had one particular relative find out uh, not in my immediate family, but another one find out that I was fasting and found out from my mother because my mother was fasting too. She was fasting, and uh, so this other relative found out she was fasting, and then uh, my mom told her that uh, not only was she fasting, but I was fasting, and my sisters were fasting too. We were all fasting for something together. And so I met her on this particular day, this, my mom, after I had, uh, before I had seen my other relatives, she told me what had taken place. So when this other relative came, met them, as soon as they opened the door, just looked right at me, have you eaten anything today? And that's not the first question you ask when you see someone like that. And just backed me right up against the wall and just shook her fist at me, Bible, quoting those Bible verses, God says to take care. Your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's going to die. You don't eat and, and your temple's going to fall away and everything else. And had all the good logic and everything and said, well, my such and such denominational church, we are godly spiritual people and we don't do that. And I don't think it's necessary to have to do that. And I don't think I've ever got, gotten a, a raking over the coals like that about anything except this one thing, and that's fasting. And this relative of mine was in a particular denomination that uh, more or less stands for this second position that I just gave you. There are occasions but wh where they will go off on a, a tangent somewhere and fast once in a while, but for the most part, fasting is a Jewish legalism that has passed away. Then thirdly, there are other groups that feel the only time you need to fast is in the face of some great crisis. 
automobile accident, surgery, discovered your son has cancer, Russia has announced they're going to invade us or whatever. The only time to fast is in the face of some tremendous crisis. A problem with this is that even those people who do fast on these occasions still themselves, even though they're obeying according to the letter, fasting, at least on occasion, they don't understand why they're doing it, they don't understand anything about fasting, and they don't understand how they can go about it. So even though they're doing it according to the letter, the Spirit's not profiting because they don't understand what the Scriptures have to teach on the subject of fasting. And I just hope that you get down tonight how important this is. Um, and I only mention this to make a point, and you know it anyway, that we've been going through a physical trial recently, and today was the worst day of it all. Now, right now, everything is manifested, and as far as I feel, I feel fine. But it doesn't matter what I feel like, I believe that I'm healed. But I know it's over this one subject right here of fasting, and uh, I'll tell you, I was just as sick as a dog today, and I didn't want to come and preach tonight. Lord, close that building down somehow tonight. Postpone it for another night. Well, then I know I've got to be back here tomorrow night and then the next day too. So you might as well start right where we are right tonight. But it's because, uh, I am firmly convinced, it's because of this one message here. Not to take into account last week's message on trials, because this <laughs> is what you get for being a preacher. Or being a disciple, you're going to get them too, so... Praise God, not just because you're a preacher, you're going to get them too. But you better believe you'll get them if you, uh, if you ever stand in the ministry or if you ever minister these things to anyone else. But I know there's one thing the devil would not want us to get a hold of, and that is the subject of fasting, because as I'm going to show you, at least the time we have tonight in the scriptures, that is one thing that has tremendous power over him, tremendous authority. And Jesus said it himself in Matthew 17. That has tremendous authority over him. Even where prayer and faith are sometimes hindered, fasting will bring the results that you need. And so, why should we think that a thing to be surprised at, that the devil wouldn't want us to know that, when that is the very thing that will give us victory and power over him? So he's smart enough to know that, and we're smart enough to know that he's smart enough to know that. I think we're on a, a fourth position here. Here we're over into the charismatic realm now, and uh, most charismatics feel that fasting, the only reason for fasting is fasting on behalf of our nation. Basically, this is where they limit fasting, and this is one area. This is certainly one scriptural area, fasting for one's country, for one's nation. But this is where most charismatics limit it, limit fasting to the preservation and protection of our nation. Preservation, protection, and prosperity, I should say, of our nation. So generally, of course, you're going to choose Washington's birthday or the 4th of July to fast for our country. And uh, we used to be on the mailing list of one group called, well, I better not say the name of the group, but that was their one emphasis. You know, we're not on their mailing list anymore. It's been years ago they took us off. I don't think we supported them enough. That's generally why you get taken off. But newsletters, and even in charismatic journals, I forget what Friday it is, the first or the second or the third or the fourth. I guess that covers all of them. But whatever Friday it is out of the month, then they always recommend that all Christians band together and fast for our country, fast and pray for our country. I think it's the fourth Friday of every month. And that's what this one particular group stood for, this one particular uh, group on fasting stood for, interceding for our country. And as I said, that is one valid and scriptural reason for fasting, but it's certainly not the only one. And then finally, the fifth position is the biblical position, and that's the one we'll be looking at tonight, the biblical position on fasting and what the Bible has to say about fasting. Now, as I started off saying about these, these different books and things that I have read on the subject, I should have gone back over some of them today and refreshed my memory, but I didn't. But basically, you're not going to really learn anything out of those books, especially if you know anything about the Bible. When I first began to read these books, of course, I didn't know anything about the Bible. 
So anything they said on fasting was something new to me. And I remember this was back in 1975, way back in the summer of 1975. So that's been, uh, what, going on seven years ago when I first began to read those books on fasting. And from that time until this time, and see, I didn't have anyone tell me do this, to, to do this. I just saw it in the Word of God. From that time until this time, we've always made it a practice to fast every Monday of every week. And there have been occasions where we'd go to some other day, but for the most part, I've held it for Monday, every, every Monday of every week for the last seven years. And what I'm saying is that I didn't get these to do that, and I didn't get what I'm saying to you right now out of books because I couldn't find any books that told me the right thing. But what I'll be giving you is what I've seen from the Word of God myself and especially what I've seen from experience. Because as soon as I began to see what the Bible had to say on fasting, that fasting was something valid for today, then I began to put it into practice right away. And so coming to, if you'll open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 16 to 18, we want to look at some verses here on some biblical teaching concerning fasting. And of course, just my personal testimony of what I said there is also a recommendation that everyone here be fasting regularly. Can't say when, can't say how often, but I can say regularly because we find in the Word of God that the disciples fasted regularly. They did it on a regular basis. As soon as we try to make a legalism out of it, and that's just what we've got, we've got a creed and a, and a formulation of doctrine that the Scriptures and Jesus never intended for us to have on the subject of fasting. And this is, and this is an area, uh, you just try it once or twice, and you'll see why the devil doesn't want you to know anything about it or why he does not want you to do it. You'll be a rare individual if you just love to fast all the time. You'll be rare because you're not made that way. Your body is not made to enjoy fasting all the time. The more you do it, just like anything else, you get used to it and you don't mind missing a day's worth of meals. You just don't mind it. When you've done it for uh, seven years or 10 years or 15 years and your body knows it's Monday and I'm not getting anything in my body today, well, uh, he'll stop complaining after a while. But I can remember first, and we had all types of these uh, wild mystical teachings about fasting. And I remember one of them was, the reason you get headaches whenever you fast is because there are impurities leaving your body. Well, what in the world? Um, how do you explain that? What, what are these impurities? Where do, they, where do they come out? I never saw one of them leak out of me anywhere. <laughs> See, here again, it's one of these spiritual mystical things. And I found out the reason you get headaches whenever you first start fasting is because, well, two reasons. Number one is because of the way this society is set up that we eat too much anyway. And then, of course, the most important reason is because the devil does not want you fasting. So, and he knows Christians well enough because he's been at practice, we have to admit, for 2,000 years. He knows them well enough that if he'll give them one or two trials, generally they'll stop what they were doing that was bothering him. And so why back down on something that's been working for 2,000 years? So he'll get, sure, sure he'll give you a trial once or twice maybe thrice or four times until he finds out you're not going to back down on that and uh, then he'll either have to resort to some other method or God has intervened on your behalf and he's not going to bother you in that area. But I dare say he'll be back sooner or later to bother you in that area of fasting. So just remember that uh, this, is, uh, this isn't a message designed to tickle the flesh but to crucify the flesh and to rob it of its food for one or two or three days a week or however often. So obviously it's not a message intended to tickle the flesh, but to rob the flesh. And as I said, we eat too much in this country anyway, and you go without food for four hours, you know what happened? Your stomach starts getting hungry. It's because it's been trained that way ever since birth. So... <laughs> Well, I better drop that subject right there. What can I say, Lord? <laughs> I 
Nothing wrong with eating. Whenever you eat, you ought to be able to eat the best, enjoy yourself. But just like I said, we eat too much in this country. Now, we don't eat too much. And you can ask my wife, we don't eat too much. We don't eat very much at all. Maybe it shows here. Uh, I just don't enjoy taking a lot of time out to eat because it takes a lot of time. And if I've, I've said many times, if I didn't have to eat or sleep, I'd skip both of them. But I can't do that because that would be unscriptural also. But if I could, I would. Because you think about eating, again, I'm not uh, against eating. I'm not on some health food kick or something like that. But uh, you think about eating, you're replenishing a body, and then that food is gone just like that. You've got to do that all over uh, the next day. The next day, you've got to do that all over again, just time after time after time. But there's nothing wrong with that. As I said, food, you have to eat food to stay healthy so you can use your body to praise the Lord. But there is a limit. Some people eat too much. In this country, you go in the supermarket and you just look on the shelves and they've got 10,000 different varieties of the same thing. And I feel that sin in this country to uh, go to such luxury and expense like that when you've got nations that can't afford anything to eat. And this country has 10,000 varieties of the very same thing. Why not just one variety of it? Matthew 6, verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Well, let's first of all come to the question, is fasting still for today? Now, just because I said it is, it, that it is still for today, that doesn't make that so. What, do, what does the, the New Testament, what do the Scriptures have to say about fasting? Is fasting still for today? Because if it is a Jewish legalism, that's fine with me. I'd, I'd praise God if it was a Jewish legalism, so we wouldn't have to do it anymore. If it is, then we'll stop. But then if it isn't, we ought to be able to find in the Word of God, and of course we're going to have to go to the New Testament to make sure that it is for today. If it isn't, just a Jewish legalism custom of the Older Testament, then we ought to be able to find somewhere in the New Testament that tells us this, and then we ought to begin practicing it and doing it. Well, let's start right here in Matthew chapter 6. Now, I pointed this out to you before, but I want to be sure that, uh, that you've seen it here in these first 18 verses. You've got three acts of the believer's worship in the first 18 verses. You have giving, then praying, and then fasting. Three acts of the believer's worship, giving, praying, fasting. Now, in all these cases, Jesus uses the self-same phrase for each one of these areas individually in telling us whether or not we should obey these areas by saying, when thou doest them, or when you, whatever it is, pray, give, or fast. He doesn't say, in other words, now, if you have the notion to do this, or if it's still for today, or if you want to, or if it feels good, or if your denomination teaches you this, then I want you to do it, he always says, when you do it. So that presupposes the fact that this is something he had already taught his disciples that they were to be doing, and that it was for today. Now, look in each one of these areas. The first one I said was giving, Look in verse 2 and in verse 3. And you see, this is just recurrent in all three of these areas. In verse 2, therefore, when thou doest thine all, not if. So that, friends, is the same as commanding you to give. Because he doesn't leave you any loophole not to give. He says when you do it. So he is presupposing that you are going to do it. And watch how many times this very same phrase appears. 
of verse 3. But when thou doest alms. Okay, concerning prayer, I believe we have it three times with prayer. Verse 5, and when thou prayest. Not an if, but when. Verse 6, but thou when thou prayest. Verse 7, but when ye pray. Now, coming to fasting, verses 16 and 17. Moreover, so he's just going on from what he has already said in the first 15 verses, moreover, when ye fast. Verse 17, but thou, when thou fastest. Now, he must be trying to get a point across or he wouldn't be saying, when you give, when you pray, when you fast, every time. So he is supposing, without any other scriptures, what he has said here on the Sermon on the Mount would be enough for me that I'm supposed to be fasting, or how can I obey this when he says, when you fast, do this. If I don't fast, then I can't obey these scriptures then. So of course it's still for today. Regardless of what people have to say about it, of course it is still for today. What people that talk about fasting being a Jewish legalism, what they don't realize is that only one day out of the entire year were Jews required to fast before the Babylonian captivity, and that was on the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16. That was the only day they were required to fast a full day. Afterwards, we end up with four fasts, as we see over in the book of Zechariah, that the people imposed themselves during Babylonian captivity. So see, I know that most denominational people don't even know that. All that was the Jewish legalism. They fasted all the time back then. Friends, they were only required to fast one day out of the year for a whole day, and that was on the great day of atonement, Leviticus 16. And that's what the, the, uh, the phrase to afflict your soul means in the Old Testament. You afflict your soul by fasting. The Psalms speak of David humbling his soul through fasting. For the continuance in the Old Testament. You afflict your soul by fasting. The Psalms speak of David humbling his soul through fasting. But to go on with some more of what the New Testament has to say, let's go over to the book of Acts, chapter uh, 13, verses 1 and 2. Acts chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. Now there were in the church, so we know that we're in the church age here, not in, uh, not in the, the uh, Old Testament dispensation, but the church age, that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So part of their ministering unto the Lord was that they were also fasting. Then I believe it's one chapter over, 1423. Chapter 14 and verse 23, And when they had chosen them elders in every assembly and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. This was in the appointment of elders in the local assemblies where they had traversed in preaching the gospel in Asia Minor. In chapter 13, of course, uh, another important time, by the way, to fast for both of these occasions. And we would cover this more in detail when we teach on fasting as such. But there are times besides a regular time where people fast on a particular day, there are other occasions that also necessitate fasting and two of these examples are in chapter 13 and in chapter 14. When these men are all, these teachers and prophets are all gathered together, uh, considering what the Lord's will is for them in their ministry and in the ministry of the church at Antioch, uh, from which they all evidently had come and of which they all were a part, 
then these men, when they had gathered together, were fasting, not only praying, but fasting to determine what the will of the Lord was for them and for their ministry. And as a result, we have the Holy Spirit speaking to separate Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And that begins an apostolic ministry there. And then in chapter 14, in verse 23, with the appointment of, of elders, choosing elders in these assemblies, well, that's going to take more than just prayer. Well, I think you'll do, and you'll do, and you'll do. You all look good. Uh, you're all head and shoulders taller than everyone else. But that got Saul in trouble. Just because your head and shoulders taller than everyone else doesn't mean anything. So besides just praying, they have fasted along with that to make sure that they get the mind of the Lord in this area. And if you've got a difficult decision in your life to make and the Word of God isn't explicit on what to do, then fasting is the way to get that answer through to you. We see that, of course, is what Daniel does over in his book in Daniel chapter 10. The first several verses of Daniel chapter 10, he has fasted to receive revelation from the Lord. Now, if it's in an area where you already know what the Word of God has to say, then fasting's not necessary there. That is, it's not necessary to make known unto you what God's will is. Maybe it's necessary to overcome the devil in that area, but it's still not necessary to reveal the mind of God to you. Such as healing. Lord, do you want me to trust you for my healing, or is it all right to go into the doctor? I'm going to fast and pray and see what your answer is. You will probably get the answer that it's all right to go on to the doctor. And I always tell people that. And I found it safe all the time thus far, and I know it'll continue to be safe, if you start praying about something that the Word of God clearly informs you what His will is, you're going to get deceived because you're trying to go and get an answer some other way than besides the way God has provided. That's the Word of God. Now, if His answer isn't in here specifically, uh, should you uh, marry this particular individual? Well, you're not going to find a verse in the Bible that says you're to marry them. But... If you want to make sure that's the one you're to marry, I'm just using that as an example, then of course you ought to be praying about it, but maybe you should fast about that situation too. But if you get in, on, get in in an area, Lord, you know, you want me to trust you or go to the finance company, and you hear any voices, uh, then they're probably going to come from the wrong source. Because if we could do that, then we don't need a Bible. We just all pray and we all get our special revelation from heaven. And you see, my friends, that's exactly what people do. They try to bypass. You see, there's no shortcut to knowing the Word of God. That takes a lifetime of learning. But no one wants to take that time. So I think I'll bypass it. Either I'll ask brother or sister so-and-so, or I'll, and the pious one says, I'll just go ask God what to do. He's not going to tell you. He already told you right here what to do. Remember whenever Moses, Exodus 14, falls down on his face, God, what am I supposed to do? We're boxed in, wilderness, mountains on both sides, Pharaoh behind, and the Red Sea before. Oh, what are we supposed to do? He already told him that he was going to deliver him back in chapters 3 and 4 with that rod that he gave him in chapter 4. He said, you're going to work miracles with this rod. And so he rebukes Moses in Exodus 14 and says, Moses, get up off your face. Why are you crying to me? I've already given you a revelation of my will and that is to stretch out your hand and I'll divide the sea hither and thither and you can part over on dry ground. Because you see, God had already given him a revelation of what he wanted him to do. And don't raise the question, well, what about if someone's weak and they don't know about the Bible? What about Gideon and he had his fleeces out there? Well, of course, the only people we're talking to and the only people the New Testament is talking to are charismatic Christians. Because any time they found, it, found someone who was not baptized in the Spirit, they corrected it just like that. Acts chapter 19, Ephesians 1, Acts chapter 10, Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 9. They corrected it right away when they found someone not Spirit-filled. So as a result, bringing up Gideon's fleece is really, uh, is really no problem at all because you've got the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we're not supposed to be laying out fleeces to find out whether that's God's will. If he hasn't revealed it in his word, you've got the Holy Spirit, friend. You ought to be able to find out what his will is. So don't let people raise those questions about weak Christians and uh, won't God give them a sign or two. 
God in his mercy will give people signs and give them a fleece if they don't know any better, but that's only going to last so long. And I'd rather start off with the best than start off with the worst and never work my way up at all. And that's what a lot of people do. Well, I'm going to start off down here till my faith is higher, and they never do grow in it. So the best, is to go, the, the best thing to do is to go ahead and start with the best, and if you die trying, then praise God, you uh, get to go on. Philippians 1, depart and be with Christ, which is far better anyway. <laughs> so praise God if you die trying. Uh, you did better than 99% of most Christians do, and that is you at least tried. I always am blessed by people that at least try. I don't care if they fail or not, if they'll at least try. Then they get enough word in them and try often enough, and they're going to start succeeding in their life. And to be even more explicit, let's go over to Mark chapter 2. And uh, this, is just, uh, this is just beyond question in Mark 2, uh, verses 18 to 20. Mark chapter 2 and verse 18. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast. They come and say unto him, talking to Jesus here, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And so you put a period or you put a question mark here and don't read the answer, and you've got a good proof text for not fasting today because Jesus' disciples didn't fast. And if we're his disciples today, then we shouldn't be fasting. Right? Right. But that's just reading the question and not the answer. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? The children being the disciples, the bridegroom being the Lord Jesus. As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Well, friends, we are still in those days when the bridegroom has been taken away from them. That is so obvious to see there. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. So if we're living in the days whenever he has been taken away from us, which we obviously are living, then we are to be fasting in these days. When he comes back again and we're with him, then there'll be no need for fasting anymore. Fasting is all in preparation, just one of the many things in preparation for the Lord's return for proving your discipleship, for proving your Christianity, for proving your loyalty, your fidelity, your faithfulness to the Lord in all areas. It's just one of those many areas of staying faithful to the Lord while he's absent. Fasting is one of these. Now, we come to another question. What can you eat whenever you're on a fast? And don't think that's a ridiculous question. That is a very common sense question asked by people. Well, what can I eat when I'm fasting? Nothing. The word fast means a volunta voluntary abstaining from food. So you cannot... And this is just the definition of the word. This isn't trying to be legalistic. You cannot chew your bubble gum, you cannot drink your coffee, you cannot drink your tomato juice or your grape juice or your grapefruit juice or your apple juice or your cider or your Jack Daniels or anything else. You can't drink anything. You can't eat a candy bar. I'll just give me a little bit of nourishment to get through the day. That defeats the purpose of your fasting. You're not supposed to have any physical nourishment, but you're gaining spiritual nourishment. Now, the word, as I said, by definition, means a voluntary abstaining or abstinence from food does not have anything to do with water. You're not commanded in the Scriptures to abstain from water, 
But since we do have examples of people abstaining from water, then we know that that is something that you do at your own discretion and the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life if you want to abstain from water. But that's not included in the word fasting, in the definition of fasting, nor in the biblical teaching on fasting. If you choose to abstain from water more than three days and it's not supernatural, you will die because your body has to have water three days or it dies after that. Now, you can go without food uh, for years and years. <laughs> I mean, some people go years without food. They have enough stored up. But even those who don't have a lot stored up, you can go weeks without food. And, uh, oh, you won't feel good, but you can live. And you read about people over in, in Ireland dying, you know, 60, 70, whatever days on a hunger strike. They've been without food 60 and 70 days. Moses went even longer than that. But that's a long time for someone not on a spiritual fast, or they think it's a spiritual, but not on a spiritual fast 60, 70 days with no food. Now, they haven't gone that long without water. They'd be dead a long time ago because that's one thing your body does have to have is water. But if, again, if it's a supernatural fast, then you're not fasting by textbooks or by medical books. You're fasting by faith. And if it's the leading of the Lord, then it doesn't matter if you go five months or five years or 15 years. If it's supernatural, it's supernatural. And if God says do it, then you do it. And of course, he gives the strength for you to do it or he wouldn't tell you to do it because you might die on his hands between now and then. Now, some people have presumptuously gone on a fast when God has not let them do that uh, just because they're grieved over the loss of their husband or wife or their child and are tormenting and afflicting themselves, and they may end up dying, going too long without food or too long without water. But, of course, we're not talking about cases like that. We're talking about charismatic Christians and those that are being led of the Holy Spirit. And so if you want to go 40 days without water, then I wouldn't recommend that unless you know God said to do it, and then it'll work. Otherwise, that won't work, not 40 days without water. But we see Moses went longer than that, and Jesus went just that long, 40 days without food or without water. And so, of course, um, and see, I've had this question from several of you before we got around this subject. What, uh, not that they were wanting to eat anything, but is it scriptural to eat anything on a fast, chewing gum, candy, or something? No. Because the very purpose of fasting physically is so that your body gets no nourishment at all. So that you can give your total concern to spiritual matters and not to physical matters. And the smallest amount of food, or that smallest bit of sugar, and I, like I said, I'm not trying to be legalistic, I'm just trying to make a point, is going to nourish your body in some way or the other. So you want to, if you're on a fast, and you abstain totally from food. And if you want to abstain from water, then that's up to you. But as I said, a fast is something that uh, you don't do because uh, it's a religious duty. You may hurt and get in trouble then, but you do it by faith in obedience to the Word of God, and then things will go well for you. Okay, another question. How long does your fast have to be? Your fast, if it's a scriptural fast, it has to be more than one day. It has to be at least one day. There is no such thing as skipping a meal, fasting, cutting out a candy bar, not having your coffee break at work, and I'm going to fast that. Uh, that's fine to do that if you want to go pray, but that's really not a fast. A fast has to get to the point where your body has used up the food that it put in at the meal before. And sometimes that can take several hours. And by, by the end of the day, though, after 24 hours, you've used up that food that you put in your body 24 hours ago. Then you know you're on a regular Bible fast now because your food, your body does not have uh, nourishment in it. It does not have nourishment. Now, of course, it has fat cells and so forth that it can digest and break down. And believe you me, it'll hop to that in a hurry when it finds out it's not going to get fed very much anymore. It'll hop to breaking down everything else that it can find to survive. And uh, that's because that's the way your body is made, to seek out and find some food to eat. And friends, this is a, it's a very, very interesting area. As I said, this whole subject of fasting, the way the body is made, 
craving, like I said, your body is made such a way that it will eat itself if you don't feed it, it'll eat itself until it gets to the point it doesn't have anything to eat. It just compa it is compelled to eat itself. It has to or it can't live. It has to have nourishment. So it'll begin to eat itself. And this is the whole parallelism between fasting and between the body and eating that the spiritual man should be that same way. He is just craving spiritual blessings, craving God, craving spiritual matters and spiritual things. At the same time, the body is just craving food. But you deny the one and give place to the other. You deny the body, you give place to the spirit. That's what is pleasing to God, and that in the spiritual realm is what works adversely against your enemy and mine, the devil. It works against him. When you're denying the flesh its food, and you are turning to the spiritual side, the spiritual man, and giving him nourishment. And during a fast, um, there's some, oh, there's so many other things about fasting. During a fast, well, let me say this. I've already mentioned before about it not being a religious duty. If you get down to fasting uh, one day a week, and I've even told this to my wife. I've said this before, that, and this is my own personal pet doctrine, pet belief. So I don't have any scripture for this, but I personally feel it's just good for your body to do without food once in a while just to get some of that junk out of it that we put in it all the time. And it just has to live just a body all by itself there. Now, I can't explain that medically, but that's what I feel. And so if someone can show me differently, then I'm going to continue believing that. That it's just good that your body doesn't have anything in it. It does just kind of cleanse everything out and you start all over again. I mean, I just feel good whenever I've been on a fast and when I break it and I get to eat food all over again. Uh, I was thinking to make another point, but now here comes another one to my mind. There's so many things about this fasting. But let me say something else about fasting, that it will give you uh, oh, several areas. Lord, what to include and what not to include, because we want to come back to this. Definitely going to come back to this and cover fasting in more detail. But you're doing without food and then eating again. Let's say you've been on a three-day fast and eating again will give you a proper appreciation for food and for God supplying your daily bread as we have here in the Sermon on the Mount like nothing else ever could. There's no way you'll ever appreciate God just having bread on your table until you've done without it for three days. You will appreciate, and you can, you can bear witness to this, after a fast, I don't care what it is, I'll eat anything after a fast. Even things I don't like, I would eat anything after a fast. Now, see, before that, uh, sometimes I'm choosing. Now, I'm not going to eat that because I don't like that. But afterwards, that, boy, that choice is gone. I could care less what it is, I'll eat it. All right, that shows me that I've now got a proper appreciation for food, just for food, and for God supplying that food for me. And you'll not have that appreciation, friends, if you've never fasted before, because you know it's mealtime and I get to eat. And you just eat and eat. It's a, like Ecclesiastes said, all the rivers are flowing into the seas, but the seas never get full and overflow. He's showing throughout his book it's just an endless cycle. And then after that, and he said, and man eats all the days of his life, but he's never satisfied. And again, this is, is, is depicting the spiritual nature, the spiritual side. You can eat today, tomorrow you're not going to be satisfied with today's food. You've got to eat tomorrow, then the next day you're still not going to be satisfied. And that's what Ecclesiastes says. You eat, you eat, you eat all the days of your life, but your soul is never satisfied. All right? Take that over into a spiritual realm, it should be the same thing. You eat and you eat and you eat, but you're never satisfied. Your soul is never satisfied. He always wants more. Now, see, most Christian souls aren't like that. They're satisfied. You give them... When we went down to, to Texas and preached down there, and uh, as I usually do, I got going for an hour and 20 minutes the first night. And I knew better than that, and I told her that I was going to keep it short because you go over 20, 25 minutes, you've lost them the rest of the service. Their cup, their basket, their truck is full. That's all they can hold after about 20 minutes. And, of course, I don't blame them. You, it's because they've not been taught. You've got to get to the place where your basket does get large enough, your cup is large enough, and then you've still got a saucer underneath it 
So when the psalmist says, my cup runneth over, then your saucer can catch all the remains of it. Then you can stay a long time and catch all the blessings of the Lord then. But you get in most churches, and uh, the first church I ever preached in, Coldwater Baptist Church, Miss Northern Mississippi, uh, foolishly, 17-year-old lad, preached for an hour and 15 minutes, and uh, had whole rows get up and leave on me. Right back here, several whole rows. I mean, the whole entire row got up and filed out just like there was a fire in the building. And, yeah, there was, brother. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. <laughs> Preached the faith message, the whole faith message in one, in one sermon there. Tried to get all of it into one sermon there. Oh, mercy, mercy, mercy. But that was a blessed time and experience. I did have one lady appreciate me. She was this one over here in this far row. And everyone else just sitting out there, it's, uh, you know, fanning themselves, hitting the flies off of them. This is in a country Baptist church. Uh, rather large but it's still a country baptist church and but this one lady over here riding down just as fast as she could and uh of course if i gave six messages on faith in one message you can imagine how many scriptures would be in that one message and i don't doubt she got every one of them down and uh, she came up afterwards and said uh she said young man i just want to tell you i've never heard anybody that knows the bible like you do and she said i just appreciate that message more than anything so that made it all worthwhile, made it worthwhile those several rows getting up and leaving for one lady to appreciate the word like that. Well, now, where were we? Praise God. Oh, I was on uh, appreciating food, and then we got onto the faith message. I don't know how we got onto that. Always gets back around to the faith message, though. But another thing I was going to say about appreci appreciating uh, things whenever you've been on a fast, another thing that you'll appreciate and we touched on this in the gift of giving, is poor people. You will begin to have a heart for people that are honestly poor, those that you meet, and you won't be like most people, I don't want to get involved and just try to pass by them. If you have ever had to go three days yourself and have nothing in your stomach, you'll know what, it, you'll know what it's like to be poor and not have enough food to eat. That's another thing that it is forever indelibly placed upon my spirit and my heart that one thing there. There was another thing I was going to say about that, but I've forgotten it for right now. We were on how long do you have to fast? Okay, another question. That is, how do you break a fast? You break it the same way you started it, and that's by faith. And that's about all the scriptures say. You fast by faith, you break the fast by faith. And you can eat whatever you desire until your soul's content. Okay, let's go over to uh, Matthew 17. I've only taught on this subject one time before, and I only had one message to do that in also. And I gave uh, several reasons for fasting, and I don't have time to give those now. We'll cover those again when we get back to them because I didn't teach that message at, at this body. But uh, here in Matthew 17, just for what I think the Lord wants us to know now about why should a believer, why should a disciple fast? Of course, the first reason, uh, if you want to know why should you fast, the first reason is because you're commanded to in Scripture. It doesn't matter whether you get any benefits or any blessings from it, you're commanded to, so you've got to do it because you're commanded to. But another very important reason that we see in Matthew 17, among other reasons, but this is the important one for us and for this body now, is because it adds a tremendous amount of spiritual power to your prayer of faith to help it break all the yokes of Satan. It adds spiritual power to your prayer of faith. Now, that does not mean that an individual can substitute fasting for faith. You cannot do that. Just because your answer hasn't come when you thought it could doesn't mean necessarily that it's always time to start fasting. Oh, it's been, you know, it's been three hours now, and I still haven't got the answer. So after three hours, they're worn out. Well, I'm going to fast now. No, you're going to get your answers by faith. But there will be occasions whenever you pray the prayer of faith where simply the prayer itself is not enough. 
And that's not going to be every time. Like I said, you can't substitute fasting for faith. Faith, you always have to have faith in there. Uh, as we're going to see here in Matthew 17, uh, the number one reason they couldn't cast out this demon, uh, verse 20, is because of your unbelief. So the number one reason is you didn't have any faith. But the number two reason, even if they did have faith, is in verse 21. Howbeit, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer, and he means the prayer of faith, not the prayer of words, but by prayer and fasting. So the number one reason is faith, but you've got another reason, and that is fasting. And so this is New Testament, friends, and Jesus said explicitly here that you needed to be fasting along with your faith there, and it would have worked for you then. Now, evidently, he means that if you had your faith there and didn't have your fasting, it still wouldn't have worked for you because he said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And when we teach on it again, I've had some experiences in my own life that I'll share with you where I've seen just tremendous results of things I've claimed by faith and one thing waited several years for, standing in faith for it the whole time, but then the Holy Spirit said it's time to fast for this situation. I fasted for that situation and in one month saw it completely change. And I'd been believing for it for two years. But the Lord and the thought of fasting had come to my mind all during that two years. But the Holy Spirit never had led me to do that. And the danger that you do not want to fall into is thinking that you can cut your trial short by fasting all the time. That's not going to work. God wants you to learn how to endure by faith. But then whenever he leads in an area that now it is time to fast, if you really want to break through in this area, then you'll have to fast. And let me just leave you here tonight with a couple of things. Number one, fasting is voluntary. That's what the word means, the definition. It is voluntary. So you have to be willing to obey the scriptures, not because I do or because that's what this body stands for, but because you want to be obedient to your Lord, then you'll fast voluntarily. And then secondly, just because we preached a message here on fasting and now it's brought to your attention, it's brought to your consciousness, it's brought to your spirit and your mind, and now you're all ready to fast, watch out because Satan will try to get you not to obey what you've heard tonight. It feels good now. It looks easy now. But it won't look this way tomorrow or next week. I can guarantee you it won't look this way next week, even though it might look fine and dandy right now. So if you're planning on fasting or being on a regular fast, you better make up your mind to do it now and then stand by that. Because that's one thing he'll be out after you for and against is to stop you from fasting tomorrow or next week. So remember that warning. Just because it feels good now doesn't mean it's going to feel good next week. But it'll still work, though. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. Isn't it grand to be a Christian? Hallelujah. Hallelujah.